guest lecture is actually a change for us. It's uh, Roger Toma. I'm very excited to actually have Roger Toma up here teaching for this five-week session. He's teaching the, the, the zoology class. Um, but our regularly, regularly scheduled speaker, uh, Sandy Doyle, um, had a family emergency, and so she had to cancel. But Roger, on, on such short notice, agreed to, to give us a crayfish kind of conservation talk today. Crayfish conservation. He even told me he's going to use the chalkboard a little bit, which yes. is yes. fascinating. Yes. Fascinating. It so will be. Good. <laughs> good. On the technical difficulty I was referring to, so the chalkboard will work for the audience here, but we're having a problem with the video. Okay. So the people that are on the webinar will be able to hear the speaker and see the slides, but won't be able to see you dancing around. Okay. Um, so that's. But I'm looking at, uh, they're going to lose out. We've got two handsome speakers today, so the audience is lost, I guess. Um, so we'll start off uh, right off the bat with, with our, um, our research lecture, and that's going to be uh, Dr. Chris Van de Goot that comes from uh, uh, Ohio Division, or Ohio Department of Natural Resources, specifically the Division of Wildlife. Um, he's lead of one of the two uh, fisheries units that are based on Lake Erie. Uh, there's, a, there's a unit based in Fairport Harbor and one in Sandusky, and uh, Chris leads the Sandusky unit. Uh, very happy to have Chris up here. He's actually teaching two workshops this summer. So once you fall in love with this island over the next five weeks and you say, I don't want to go home, I want to come back and learn more stuff, Chris is teaching a fish aging one-day workshop and a three-day uh, fisheries fundamentals workshop. Um, and those are in August, I think it's like 26, 27, 28 is the fisheries fundamental, and then maybe August 29th. Or is it 16, 17, 18? I think that those are starting. Yeah, yeah, those are starting. So August 17, 18, 19, and then maybe August 20 is the fish. So if you're not back in session with the college youth tenant or back in session if you're, if you're still in high school, those workshops would be beneficial. And I've been working with Chris on this for quite some time. We've had the discussion. This is the first time we've kind of rubber meets the road. But what Chris sees when they hire individuals at, uh, for the Division of Wildlife, you know, he knows what kind of skill sets he wants coming out of a university graduate. And so these are some of the things that I've spoken with him about, that these are things that, these are skills that often he doesn't get to applicants that come to the Division of Wildlife. And so if that's something like a job that you think you'd be interested in, <coughs> excuse me, fighting a cold, um, these are skill sets that would, you know, are things that him and his colleagues are looking for in fishery biology. So if you have the opportunity and it fits your schedule, I, I recommend you get back on our website when you're there. I'm also happy to have Chris here because uh, he's a recipient of one of the grants um, that we give out every two years. So you're at Ohio State University Stone Laboratory. That's part of my role and the staff role that works for this program. But we also are affiliated with a group called Ohio Sea Grant. It's one of 33 programs across the nation. Um, any state that comes into the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Gulf of Mexico, or one of the Great Lakes has a Sea Grant program. And part of that Sea Grant program's mission is to get money from NOAA, the federal government, and turn that money right back out to do research that's critically important to Lake Erie. And the work that uh, Chris is going to talk about a little bit today, uh, I don't think it's the entire talk, a little bit today, is about some of the work that he has actually been funded um, through our program to conduct. I mean, we've had a long, great partnership with the Division of Wildlife on the lake, and so I'm really excited to have, have Chris here. Chris, if you could right off the, the start, and kind of ask our speakers just to kind of give a quick set, snapshot of where you started and how you got to where you're at. You know, I think a lot of students realize that that path from being a high school that maybe wants to do biology to their first career position is not necessarily a straight yeah. point. No. So uh, if you could just give a quick introduction on that when you come up to the top. And then, uh, so if I told any of my high school teachers I continued into higher education, they would probably fall over laughing. <laughs> because I had zero interest in academics while I was in high school. However, once I got into college and started taking some classes that interested me, specifically fisheries and statistics, a light came on and I started paying attention. So I did my undergraduate at Virginia Tech. I went to Tennessee Tech and did a master's degree. Worked up in Minnesota for a year. Got the job here in Sandusky for the Department of Natural Resources. And then seven years ago, started on my PhD while I was a biologist at Michigan State. And so that's kind of how I took. I was that non-traditional student who made me in some of your classes that you all made fun of. And Oh, anyway, that was, that's been my route. Great. Thanks yep. for that. Yep, video's up. So now they get to see the handsome dudes that I was talking about. This is fantastic. All right. Great. So, Chris, if you're ready, then yep. I'd love to have you come on up.
and now I guess we dance. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Dr. Winslow. So when we think about migration in animals, what do we generally think of? We may think of elk, right? They winter down in the lowlands, and in the summer they go up to the mountains to graze and, and so on and so forth. Or, this is going to be fun, which, one I, which button am I using? It's glowing. There we go. Or we may think about waterfowl, right? We hear about birds making massive migrations from their, uh, their breeding grounds in the spring to uh, their wintering grounds in the fall, in the winter. <clears throat> or if we have a bent for fish, we may have an eye to uh, the Discovery Channel, wherever it is, where they're conducting this, this research on sharks, and they're looking at these large-scale movements of sharks due to technology. But we may not think that a fish that you may catch right off the shores right here exhibits this large-scale movement. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about to you tonight uh, with respect to the work that I've been uh, involved with and how it pertains to the management of these species uh, in Lake Erie. Just for a little bit of background information, walleye are what we call the apex predator in Lake Erie. They're found in all three basins, the western, central, and eastern basins of Lake Erie. And they are the dominant and top predator, so they have a, the ability to, to basically shape the forage community. Um, they're very economically uh, important. Here we have uh, a graph of walleye abundance in the blue circles, and I see my animation did not translate somehow. So in the dark uh, blue uh, bars, you see the population abundance of walleye from 1978 to current in Lake Erie. And then the red line shows the quotas. If that's the safe harvest levels we establish every year. And so we use population models based on assessment data, very much like what I'm going to be showing you today, to come up with population estimates. Then we just say, okay, this number of fish of walleye can be safely harvested in Lake Erie. So the, the, the information I showed you today is going to have direct, has direct implications in the management of this species. All right, so using acoustic telemetry to understand the movement patterns of walleye in Lake Erie, Lake Huron, and the Huron Erie Corridor. That's the interconnecting water between Lake Huron and uh, Lake Erie. And as you can see by my the author list here, there's a lot of different agencies represented. And this project does span multiple jurisdictions and is an international project. We work with inter, uh, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources uh, very closely on this. So this is an international fishery. A lot of people don't even think of that. But that has large ramifications because their desires and what they want out of the fishery are often different than what the recreational fishery in Ohio is looking for. So for some of you who may not be as familiar with Lake Erie, we're here at the western end of the lake, and laser pointer may or may not work. There we go. Western end right here, central basin and eastern basin. Here's what we call the Huron Erie Corridor, Lake St. Clair, Lake Huron. So as uh, Dr. Winslow indicated, I work out of the Sandusky Fisheries Research Unit. I supervise that office, and we have an office over at Fairport Harbor. Now, all of this, what did I break? Okay, let's go old school and go up and down arrow. Does that work? <laughs> We're going to work there. We're going to put that down. Can you use our house? I don't think so. No. All right, there you go. I make it simple. So all, all of this work we do is actually done through the auspice of the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. That's where all the agencies sit down and collectively manage the lake. And so you'll hear a lot about stock assessment models, and that's kind of what this information is being used for. Historically, we would look at walleye movement rates and mortality rates through what we call jaw tagging of fish. And basically what this is, it's very much like a waterfowl band that they use and as uh, one of the projects is kind of like today. You guys have been, some has been banding birds. This is actually a non-corrosive alloy, uh, very similar to a duck or a goose band that we would place on the jaw of walleye. We would release them and look at their, the data through time. And if we take, out, take a look at some of the data we've collected with Lake Erie walleye, these are fish that were tagged down here at the eastern end of the lake. What we see is those fish basically stayed at the eastern end of the lake. If we take a look at the fish that were tagged in the western end of the lake, or the western basin, you see these fish are very... Uh, they have a, a large distribution, right? They go out here to the east, but they also migrate up north, up into Lake Huron. So they have a wide distribution. That means that they're being subject to a lot of different fisheries and a lot of 
different jurisdictions. And so that's why we manage the, the resource collectively so that we're on the same page and so that we're making sure that these fisheries aren't being overexploited. One of the deficiencies of this type of information, though, is that it's limited because all we know is where a fish was captured and then where it was, uh, where it was tagged and then where it was recaptured. So that's good for some baseline data, but it doesn't give us uh, finer scale data. And so we're always looking for this better way, right, the better way of understanding walleye movement in Lake Erie. And I will note, though, that this historic tagging study did reveal some pretty significant uh, findings, which we are actually testing and refining more with this uh, acoustic telemetry project. And that, that is that these western basin stocks are highly mobile, and that the older and larger females are more likely to migrate. And that probably has something to do with their physiology. And they show this propensity to migrate not only to the east within Lake Erie, but outside of Lake Erie, up into Lake Huron. So this network, I guess is what you would call it, it's the Great Lake uh, Acoustic Telemetry Observation System. We refer to it as GLaDOS was established uh, thanks to some GLRI, Great Lakes Research Initiative funding, back a few years ago. And basically the purpose of this project, and it reaches all over the Great Lakes, is to address movement and behavior studies at geographic scales that previously were not feasible, okay? We were looking at walleye movements in Lake Erie's fairly small spatial scale. What we're able to do now is look at uh, fish movements on a very, very large the way acoustic telemetry works is very simple. If you've driven, ever driven on the turnpike, you've seen the Easy Pass system where you have this transmitter basically in your car and as you drive through the terminal, it says, yep, got you. And then at the end of the month, you get this report of where you were and when you were there and it calculates how much you owe, right? So this is kind of the same thing. So this is our receiver. This is what the toll booth is. It's the size of about two soda cans stacked on, on the end and we deploy these in the lake and we submerge them so people don't know where they are. The way this works is that this receiver is capable of listening in this sphere around where it is deployed. And as a fish swims or moves into the sphere where it's listening, the transmitter goes off. That data is then stored on the, on the receiver until we go and retrieve the receiver. And thank you, WebEx. Uh, the animation here is that after this re re receiver's been in the water for about a year, we go over to the receiver, we send down a code, and the whole unit pops up to the surface. We take the, the unit on board, replace the batteries, redeploy it. So it's really like having somebody sitting down there and monitoring 24-7. So this is a really powerful tool for us for monitoring fish movement uh, in Lake Erie. If we take a look here on the GLaDOS slide, each of these little red dots represents where one of these acoustic receivers are located. I do not maintain all of these. I'm very thankful for it. However, but my name is associated to a large number of the ones in Lake Erie. And so what you can see here is that uh, utilizing this vast array of receivers that we are able to follow these fish wherever they might go. And it's really been quite interesting. We've actually been seeing fish move out towards the Niagara River through uh, the Welland Canal, something we never really would have thought was happening. So gives us ability to uh, document movements at scales we never were able to do so. So the current projects that I'm currently involved with on Lake Erie involve uh, about five different projects. There's one on the Maumee River, to St. Reef, the Sandusky River that Dr. Winslow alluded to a little bit earlier. That one's kind of unique because it's evaluating the effects of the dam removal. Ballville Dam is slated to be removed. Of course, litigation had to come in and it's about two years behind schedule, which is going to make for an interesting progress report to Sea Grant. But anyway, um, that's the project he was referring to earlier. And then we have projects that are coming online this year in Van Buren Bay. That's in the Eastern Basin as well as in the Grand River, Ontario. So you can see we have quite a few projects going on simultaneously. Um, project objectives. We always do research, right, because we need an objective. We need to find out what we're studying. So some of the objectives that we have identified for these projects include estimating spawning site fidelity rates. If a fish is tagged on Sault St. Reef, What's the probability that fish goes somewhere else and spawn? Does it come back to that same reef on an annual basis? Or does it spawn on two St. Reef one year and does it go to the Maumee River another? Because we're able, another year, because we have transmitters in these fish, we can actually tell where that fish goes on an annual basis. Uh, and we can also determine if that fish spawns uh, on an annual basis, or at least goes back to spawning grounds on an annual basis. We can look at inner and intralake movements, habitat selection, temporal structuring, 
how are these fish moving throughout the lake and when? And then this kind of the, the area that I'm most interested in is estimating fishing and natural mortality rates for stock assessment modeling. And hey, yes, this is going to work. So here's the first video I have for you of the night. They always say if you don't have really good data, at least wow them with videos. <laughs> All right. Hey, here we go. Video. So here we're going to have uh, a video of me putting in a transmitter in the Western Basin. So here you see uh, one of the technicians. There's a walleye on the bench measuring for probably about a 26, 27 inch fish. Looks like a female. He's removing the first three dorsal fins for each estimation. We cut them off and we'll look at them underneath the microscope. It's not a fish. What's that? Just like a tree does. Val? Taking a shit on us. Oh. Yeah. See what I've got for closing so, uh, the cooler up? Now this fish is being put into a hard electric engine. A hose nozzle. A hose nozzle. Now, this is going to be the first fish that I'm going to put in the Of the, of the reef for quite a while. Then he moves over to the western lobe. 
you can kind of get an idea when he's spawning because he stays there for a long period of time and then he moves off and then he goes back to the other side. And he's kind of bouncing back and forth covering uh, both sides of the reef. Now here we're going to show you a female coming onto the reef. So this is a female that was 532 millimeters. So this is actually probably a female spawning for the first time. It's just a little bit over 20 inches. Um, and so you see it coming onto the reef in 2014 on um, May the 2nd. So here you see the female. She says, well, too many guys on the reef. I'm taking off. She goes on and quickly slides off. She hangs off to the side. And then you see her come back on, and she stalls out on the reef for a prolonged period of time, presumably spawning, comes back on, and then slowly meanders back off. And so we never saw her again on that reef during that spawning period. So we're able to look at where on the reef that female was spawning, when she was there, how long she was there, what habitat she is spawning over, because we can go down there now and do uh, habitat mapping to see exactly what kind of substrate she was spawning on. Okay, so this is some of the data I'll present you. This is from our illustrious, uh, illustrious Jason Gosto. He's an REU here, and uh, he's actually working as a research associate in our lab. And he's going to, and using this VPS data, the data I just showed you on the reef, he's going to look at what these fish, not on the, the reef, when these fish were initially released, what these fish do right after surgery. And the reason we can do that, again, is because we know where the fish is, these fish are through time. So what we do here is we calculate the average swimming velocity or swimming speed of a fish after it's released. And based upon the swimming velocity, we can get an idea of what they were doing. Did the surgery, you know, slow them down, or were they able to, to pick back up and continue swimming, uh, resume, normal swimming speed. So what we see is this eight hour lag almost where the fish is really just kind of hanging out right where we released it, not moving a whole lot. Then all of a sudden it starts moving around quite a bit. Take a look here at a different fish. And here you see it was a much longer period of time that this fish kind of hung out. This was almost over what, uh, two and a half days. And then all of a sudden you start seeing it being more active. And so we're able to assess the behavior of this fish right after surgery. One of the assumptions of tagging, uh, tagging projects is that you do not affect the behavior of the tagged individual. So we're able to validate or uh, examine these assumptions using this type of data of what are these fish doing. And now we can start using this, looking at swimming rates and velocities when these fish are up on the reefs to get an idea of when are they spawning. Are they spawning during the day or during the night and so on and so forth. So those are some fine scale movements. We'll move now into broad scale movements. And that's utilizing these receivers over this larger uh, uh, array or this larger network of listening stations that are uh, used to determine movements. So here we're going to look at uh, uh, some animations for fish that we released in 2012 in the Maumee River. It's indicated over there, the far, farthest western basin spawning uh, stock that we, 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 we know of. Um, and this was a project that was done in collaboration with some folks from Carleton University as well as US Fish, uh, USGS. And so what you're going to see here, and I really hope that this bar, if this bar does not disappear, it's going to be major problems. Um, what you're going to see is you're going to see two groups of fish. You're going to see one group of fish being released and coming on this map up here in the Titabawassee River, and then another fish, of, a group of fish being released uh, down here in the Maumee River, because this project was evaluating looking at two different spawning stocks released at basically at the same time. So watch the dots. So basically what you, oh, come on, you see your first part. Oh, there we go. So basically what you see is that the, the mommy fish, these mommy fish going up the urinary corridor in the summer and then in the fall heading back down to the mommy River. You see a similar pattern for the Tittabawassee fish. They leave the Tittabawassee River. They move out through Saginaw Bay. Some of them go down to the south towards uh, Lake Erie, to the southern end of Lake Huron. Some of them go up the North Channel. So we're actually able to look at the divergence of these stocks and see if actually maybe there are multiple stocks spawning in the same river. They just separate themselves during the course of the year. And so you can get an idea that this is the type of information we could get with no other type of technology other than satellite tagging, which is, you know, well into the future for freshwater environments. And it provides us a lot more data than uh, the historic uh, jaw tag data that we used to 
rely on. Okay, so we saw the two St. Reef fish that the video I showed you of me tagging the fish was on two St. Reef, and so we'll take a look at a few fish spawning on two St. Reef. So these are fish, re this was a fish released on the 4th of April in 2003. So you see this fish leaving the western basin during the summer, it's making its way to the central basin, it moves back to the western basin, flies over to Cleveland for a while, and then heads back towards the reefs, spawns on the reef. The following year, follows the south shore, and then the last time we observed the fish, which was in April of 2014, it was still in the eastern basin of Lake Erie. Here's a different fish. I think the reason I put this is it shows a little bit different moving, movement pattern. There, this fish detected in the central basin, goes right back to the same receivers, and then heads back to the west, hangs out over the winter, spawns on the reefs, heads back out to the east. It's kind of known, known about in the middle of the lake. So here we're able to look at when those fish are moving that way, and we can start to look at different uh, variables, water temperature, dissolved oxygen, forage fish movement with other surveys that we have relating these movement patterns to other abiotic and biotic variables. Um, and we've tagged some fish here in the Detroit River. We'll take a look here at what these fish do. Again, I'm giving you, there's lots and lots, millions and millions of data points, and you try to summarize them into nice animations, which don't get published, but which can be used for publishing papers and describing their movement uh, behaviors and patterns. And so here we have these Detroit River, uh, one of these Detroit River fish. Yeah, it goes down and visits the folks spawning in the western basin reefs and heads out to the eastern basin during the summer and basically spends the summer out in the eastern basin, just kind of milling around. So what's very notable about the eastern basin is we never thought that the eastern basin was really walleye habitat. The eastern basin is relatively infertile, uh, very clear water, very relatively low forage out there, but it has cold water. We never thought that they were really using that area of the lake, but this, this, this telemetry data is showing they spend quite a bit of time down the eastern basin and actually out in the middle of the lake, which is, again, another thing that I never would have, um, I, I wouldn't, it was news to me, a shock to me. And I think this is the last one, and here we have fish, this fish, rather than heading up, oh, no, here we go, bounces around the western basin for a while, and again, where does it head? Out to the eastern basin. So this fish is basically going from the Detroit River out to the eastern basin in a matter of a few months. That's a couple hundred miles. The fish is migrating out to that end of the lake. And one more. So here is a fish that, again, migrated. Instead of going into Lake Erie, migrated north up into Lake Huron, hung up out in Lake Huron for the summer. And so what we can able to start doing now is, on, like, say, for this Detroit River stock, we can say what proportion of the fish migrate north, what proportion migrate down south into Lake Erie, and look at different stock contributions. Okay, I think this is the one that buggered on us. No. So I was telling you before that we were looking at the behavior of these fish right after release. Um, basically, these five receivers represent an area where we would release all the fish into when we tag them. Here two, is two St. Reef, here's Crib Reef, and Niagara. One of the issues we had was collecting females. The males were very easy to collect off the reefs because they all congregated there. The females spend very little time on the spawning grounds. We think they're in and out, and that's what the telemetry data will be useful for. So we had to collect them actually in a very large area off as they were staging. Um, so anyway, what, we're, what I'm hoping I can do, I don't know which videos got buggered up is basically what I want to show you is the complete life history of a fish from the time we dropped it into the water to the time it was reported to us. And so I'll see if the videos are going to allow us to do that. So here we see this fish being dropped into the release array, swimming around for a little while. We lose track of it for a few hours. It's going to come back in here eventually before it finally disappears um, for the season. A lot better when, if I know this is all going to work. So it comes back in. You kind of get this sense that it's moving out. Okay, and we cannot play this video. So basically, and yeah, we cannot play this video, and we cannot play this video. 
But this is what that fish did. If I piece all together, which I was going to do in videos, basically what you see is this fish was released here in the Western Basin, moved down here, moved down here, came back, spawned the following year, moved down here, moved down here, moved down here, and then was finally harvested by this ice fisherman last winter just west of uh, West Sister Island. I called us up from the shanty. He goes, I got one of your fish. So we're able to put its complete life history back together, reconstruct it from the time we dropped it in the water to the time somebody harvested it. And we can look at specific periods of time of what that fish was doing in the different areas of the lake. So a lot of the information I've showed you so far has just been location data. Where are these fish and what are they doing? If we insert these thermal buttons into the fish, which is something I neglected to tell poor uh, Zach here, on a, a subset of these fish, we actually, on all of them, we, put a, we glue a temperature button to the transmitter. And if we get that transmitter back, we're able to download the data. So once every four hours, uh, it records a water temperature because while I and all fish are cold-blooded, their body temperature represents what's around them in, in the environment. So we're able to get a thermal history, actually, of this fish through time. And so there's different types of thermal buttons. This one is called a wee tag, and actually, um, records depth and temperature simultaneously, and so we can reconstruct these histories for these fish. So this was a fish that was released here in the Maumee, Maumee River in 2013 or 14. I think it was 2014, yeah. It was released in 2014. These green dots represent place uh, receivers where that fish was detected on the receiver. So I know a fish was here at this period of time. Then ultimately this fish was harvested up here in Ontario uh, later in the fall. So again, we're recreating the movement of an individual fish. So the way to look at this graph is, is that the date is here on the x-axis, and the depth of that fish on that day is here on the y-axis. And so these data points that have this open circle represent a period of time when I know where that fish was. That fish was within 750 meters of that listening station. And so we're able to reconstruct what that fish was doing and what thermal habitat it was occupying during different periods of time. So here during the summer, we see this fish is occupying very cold water. And anybody who knows anything about fish physiology is that this fish is capable, these fish are capable of, um, I'm sorry, this is not temperature, this is depth. This fish is making very large vertical movements in the course of a 24-hour period, okay? It's going from close to the surface down to 10 meters, or at 5 meters, down to, uh, you know, 18 meters within a 24-hour time period. So it's making fairly large vertical uh, movements in the course of a 24-hour period. When we marry that data with the temperature data that the, fish, the tag is collecting simultaneously, we're, we're really learning a lot because these dashed lines here represent what we call the thermal optimal for walleye between 20 and 24 degrees Celsius. Well, what we're finding here is that, yeah, they like 20 to 24 degrees Celsius, but you know what? They're capable of existing for long periods of time where they're inhabiting water that's below their thermal optimum for quite a long period of time. Physiologically, this has got to be very expensive for a fish going from 10 degrees Celsius to near 25 degrees Celsius in a 24-hour period. So that, the metabolism of that fish has to adjust to compensate for this. It'd be like you running inside and outside of your house in the middle of the winter when it's zero degrees it's playing havoc with your, your thermal regulatory system on a different scale for fish because they're cold-blooded. But anyway, large differences in thermal experiences that fish is uh, experiencing in a 24-hour day. So the question is, what have we learned? Well, we've learned a lot, I would argue. Some of the movements that we found with the jaw tags have been confirmed. Yes, fish migrate out to the east, and yes, fish migrate out to the north. So that's nothing new. We're able to put some uh, tighter time frames on it because we actually know when these fish are moving because we have dates associated with them. But we're also starting to see some new patterns emerge, and that is the, the, the prevalence of these fish to occupy the middle of the lake. If you remember from the graphs I showed you early on, there weren't a whole lot of dots in the middle of the lake. Well, that's one, a function of nobody's fishing out there. So if people aren't fishing out there, they're not going to catch a fish that's out there and report its tag. This type of information is what we call fishery independent data. It's not re re relying on the fishery to gain information. So what we're finding is that these fish occupy the middle of the lake far more than we ever thought. Historically, suitable walleye habitat was defined as all waters within seven fathoms. 
Does anybody know what seven fathoms represents? Thirteen meters. I think it, it, it translates roughly to about thirteen meters. So they said, oh, walleye, optimal habitat for walleye is less than thirteen meters. If I were to show a graph of thirteen meter water in the central and eastern basins to you, it's a little ring around the margins. What we're finding is that no, that's probably not a really adequate definition for what suitable walleye habitat is in Lake Erie. <clears throat> we're, we're, we're gaining a new understanding of depth and temperature and how fish regulate and orient with these two variables. Now, inevitably, these fish are chasing forage, whether it be uh, rainbow smell, uh, emerald shiners, or gizzard shad. But we're getting a better idea of what these fish are capable of doing and what they have to do when they're in these different zones in order to survive. They have to eat. When they're in cold water, they have to eat because it's outside the thermal optimal. But maybe their thermal optimal is a lot different. Maybe that thermal optimal varies for males and females and then for fish of different sizes. So that's something we can start getting at here with this type of information. What are the management implications? I am a big proponent <coughs> of research for doing research is great but they really need to be tied to some type of management implication. Society is not going to continue funding research just for giggles or for somebody to get their tenure. There needs to be a reason why you're doing that. And so the management implications that we're trying to tie very tightly to the work we're doing is gaining a better understanding of spawning ecology. This gives us an idea of why fish, why the larger and the younger fish may be spawning at different times and why that's important from a, a population uh, perspective. There's a lot of evidence that shows that the best and the most stable stocks are those stocks that represent both young and older age groups in the spawning population because they spawn at different times. And that makes a lot of sense because you're not putting all your proverbial eggs into one basket, but you're dispersing them throughout a protracted period of time. It's like the northeast blow we had. If we had that blow during the spring, it probably would have wiped out all the eggs that were on the reef if they were all laid at once. But if you have, egg, if you have eggs being laid at different stages throughout the spawning season, it's kind of what we call bed hedging. You're, you're kind of, the population is putting chances that we'll pull off a year class even if conditions aren't right either earlier or later on uh, in the spawning <coughs> season. The timing of the movement. When are these fish moving? That has a lot uh, to do with how we set regulations, when fisheries can be existing, uh, occurring in an area, and maybe when we should hold off so if fish are too vulnerable uh, for uh, being exploited during certain periods of time. Look at stock-specific movements. Not all the fish do the same thing. Even within one spawning stock, there are likely different spawning contingents that one goes this way and another group goes this way. So we're getting a better understanding of how these stocks vary and uh, you know what that might mean for long-term sustainability. And then, of course, the kind of what's in my wheelhouse is this whole population assessment. It's using this data to uh, inform our stock assessment models, getting an idea at what rate these fish die due to natural causes and to fishing uh, causes. And so what uh, Zach is going to be working on is actually looking at what percentage of these fish that come to spawn in a given year actually survive to later in the summer and what fraction of the population may actually be dying due to spawning related uh, stresses. <coughs> so the challenges, aside from having you know hundreds of millions of data points and bogging down Excel, I mean Excel just, they can't even open these files. You can just say, oh, I'm done. Um, it's working with very large data sets, but the challenge is taking these individual movements and relating them back to a population level and saying, what does this information tell us about the population as a whole rather than unique nuances of each individual little fish out there? And Chris, I don't know what time I'm at. I don't know if I blew over. No, no, no. This is, this is um, so we have time to time. We look at I've got time. What kind of fidelity do you think you're seeing to spawning ground? Off the cuff, I'd say it's very high. very high. The genetics seems to support that. Our jaw tagging seems to support that. It makes a lot of sense from an ecological perspective. But there's ultimately going to inevitably going to be some strain. I would say it's going to be probably higher than 85%, but I'm not for we haven't gotten that far into the data. Have you got any Grand River yet? Grand River, <coughs> Grand River Ohio? Ohio, yeah. We, we've overlooked that stock only because it's so small relative. Yeah. Yeah. What we are going to start doing, though, is actually is looking at contribution is where, so we, where we tag these fish when they're in the mixed fishery and then see where they go back to spawn. Oh, 
So it may be that, you know, during certain periods of time, that Grand River is contributing to the population or to the fishery very high. But when you have 20 million western basin fish coming out, you, you kind of get an idea of swamping the population. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, this is very, very cool. Yeah. Doug? Do you guys look at stable isotopes as the type of meeting? No, and that was kicked around, and that was kind of one of my, you know, this might be my ignorance or my bias, but that right there with eDNA sometimes. Um, I, I just, I, I don't know what it's telling me. Without a thorough background of what's out there, I, I, it's been kicked around. Justin, then I'll get to some students. I'm sorry, I'm showing you uh, <laughs> Professor Bias here. Justin. That's something that at first, at first glance, I'd say, ah, anoxia is not a problem for walleye. There's surface feeders, plagiarism feed, not a problem. What we're finding from a lot of this data, though, is that these things are bottom oriented while they're in the central basin. So that's probably a next step is that if we take a look at some of these dynamic hypoxic models and we can overlay them with fish <coughs> with walleye distribution through time, probably going to be a very good way to do this. So, yeah. Now, we only have depth data for a handful of fish. We don't, they're not all depth tags. Those additional depth tags are another 180 bucks a pop on top of a $300 tag to begin with. So there's only a subset of those that we have that. But I think it does then start giving us more way of evidence that, hey, we should be putting depth tags in more of these fish um, to look at how these fish relate to hypoxic zones when they're up there. How many of these detectors do you use under the water, and how do you decide where to so somebody asked that as Zach. Let's be honest with you. I have a freaking <laughs> I mean, honestly, there's like over a hundred. Jason, how many? There's you went by the number of anchors. Like how many anchors? Did you, how many anchors? <laughs> Tommy and Jason, over the last year, how many hundred and twenty pound anchors have you made? Uh, well yeah. over hundred. Yeah. So, so in Lake Erie itself, we probably got close to hundred with all that central, east, western, eastern basin stuff. I'm responsible probably for about 90 of them. Then you have the ones in the Huron Erie corridor. There's about 60 or 70 in there, and then there's a bunch of them in Lake Huron. And so that's why this is a collaborative network. There's no, there, there's data propriety in that. If my fish shows up on their receivers, they report it to me. If their fish show up on my receivers, when I download the data, I just know it's their fish. I don't know anything about it. I don't know how big it was, the sex of it, or whatever. So it, it, the point is for researchers to share their data but yet then have coverage where I normally wouldn't have had coverage. And so, I mean, honestly, all Paul, I probably have my fish showing up on 200 plus receivers. How do you decide where to? How do I decide where to put them? So if you took a look at that map, it's basically a natural, what I call natural breakpoints. And if I were doing this study again, I would probably do it a whole lot differently. I'd probably go to more of a systematic sampling of, of putting these things every five kilometers in some type of grid pattern. But what we did, uh, initially was we wanted to know what the movement rates were past certain areas. And so we set up a double line on the western basin because I wanted to be able to detect fish moving from one way and back, okay? So I needed a double line there to say, oh, look, it's on this, on the western receiver, now it's on the eastern one, so I know it went from west to east, and now it's fall, and it's gone from east, east to west. I am a proponent that you don't need that. It's too much. It's overkill. It's a bad use of resources. You can look at the patterns in the detection history at a given location and say, ah, this is the way it went. So, so you see we had one down the belly of the, the, the uh, central basin. You see we had one down by the eastern basin. These represent, you know, kind of geographic areas that we want to understand fish movement through these areas. So all the receivers in the middle of the lake are actually done in conjunction with EPA sampling, where they have temp and DO loggers down there for the hypoxic uh, monitoring the hypoxia, and we were able to piggyback our receivers on there on their sense, on their unit, to just say, hey, can we put this on there? And they're like, yeah, sure. Anybody else? So Chris, I was seeing uh, when you did the early slides showing the jaw tags of, of you know, recaps and the tagged in the eastern basin and mm -hmm. coverage, and it showed the eastern basin kind of had fidelity for the eastern basin. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of showed the western basin one showing that they're throughout. 
never really saw anything from the central basin. What do you think is happening in that? There, there, there's, so, there's not really large spawning stocks in the central basin. And so we've never tagged fish there. Those were, they were just where tags had originated from. What I suspect is they're probably hanging out in the central basin, maybe sliding down towards the eastern basin. What I think that there's evidence for, and what the, 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 the first jaw tag in the paper alluded to, is that as these fish get bigger and older, their physiology changes the opposite of humans, right? When we're young, we love the cold. We love, you know, but when we get old, what happens? Everybody migrates down to Florida, right? That's where all of the snowbirds go. Well, it's actually the reverse, with, we think, with walleye. As they get older and larger, they want to conserve energy, so they move into these cooler water habitats where their metabolism is slowed down, so that as they forage, they can retain that weight. If they were to stay in the western basin, they would basically be sweating that weight off. I used to work in some Minnesota lakes, and you'd see real big fish in the summer, and they just look gone. They were just a head and a tail. They might be big, but they just, it was too warm for them. So physiologically, they didn't have a refuge to go and hide. And that's probably why Lake Erie, I would argue, hands down, is the best place in the world for walleye, because they have the best of both worlds. They have warm water when they're young, and they have cold water with abundant forage when they're bigger and larger. Are the males doing the migration? Like, are they doing the migration? Yes, they both are. And I think that was one of the biases of the historic studies, and they were only tagging larger fish. So what we set out to do is we stratified our samples to put them in small fish and young fish. It used to be when they go out and tag, they say, okay, my quote is 2,000, go out two nights in a row, boom, tag them, done. What I showed in some of my dissertation work, what we're seeing is that these fish come in in waves. And the early spawners are big fish, and towards the end of the spawn are the younger females. And so we intentionally put tags in different size groups of fish so we can address those questions. Uh, with their movement patterns. The nice thing about these transmitters is they last for four years. I could actually program the blast for 10 years with monkeying around with the ping rates. But for four years, I can follow an individual, which that's kind of cool. You can find out what that fish is doing from when it's younger until it gets older and, you know, so, yeah. All right, no more questions. Are we going to thank Chris again? <laughs> Use the restroom or, or walk around a little bit. Let's gather at uh, ten after eight, and we'll start. Uh, we'll start the next uh, talk. Those are the, on the webinar. I'm just going to mute the phone for a bit, but we'll be back uh, at ten after eight. Uh, I want a couple announcements before I introduce our next speaker, uh, Roger Toma. But the uh, first one I want to mention is, is Chris alluded to Zach quite often in the last talk. Sorry, Zach, you were on that. But remind me that I should you know announce the individuals that are here. Um, and you're probably or you may be aware of this, there are 10 students that are taking the courses up here that you're taking that are also REU students. And REU stands for Research Experience for Undergrads. So it's a program we offer where the students apply for that opportunity, and if selected for that opportunity, they, on their off days when they're not in class, they're doing independent research projects with supervisors. And so Zach's one of his projects, or his project is working with Chris Vandergut. Um, so that's how that's going on. So while you're here on the island uh, this summer, if you're still kind of early in your college career and you talk about the work they're doing and the experience that, that, that they're getting and it's something you're interested in, we offer this every year. We bring on anywhere from 9 to 11 REU students every summer. So if this is something that interests you or, or you know, it's exciting for you, definitely look into that opportunity for next summer. So that's one of the things I want to mention. The other thing I wanted to go around with all the professors um, and see Tom, Dr. Quiz Simon. Tomorrow. Quiz tomorrow. Any other announcements for your students that they need to know? have to be looking for a goby roundup, it looks like. Ooh. Not enough gobies? We need more. Huh. So they're eradicated from the lake that quick, no, huh? No, we just, need, we just need large numbers. Okay. Matt, do you hear that? I mean, is there anyone that the staff can be doing to help round that up, too? Well, uh, I think they already yeah. are. We can help us. Okay. Good. Good. Roger, before you talk, is there any announcements for your, your students in zone? Next class test. Ooh. You going to give any answers on the, during your talk? No. No. No? <laughs> Dr. Kane, any announcements for you? Tomorrow, Pat, first thing, 8 o'clock, make sure you go over your staff. And if you guys don't do well, no pizza party on Friday! Oh, yeah, right before the 4th of July. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bates. <Bates. laughs> No, it was from our field trip. There was a mean uh, teacher lady with about like 57-year-olds. 
to introduce, and again, he's a, he's a professor with us on the island uh, this week, or these five weeks, uh, Roger Toma. And this is especially, you know, uh, important for me when I look back over my academic career and, and how I got to where I am right now. Um, I, was, I had the opportunity between my junior and senior year at Ohio University, so that's where I got my undergrad at, um, and I applied for an internship with EPA. And so I was uh, selected for that position, and, and my boss for that summer was Roger. And so I spent my my junior and senior years uh, on his electro fishing boat, uh, primarily the Black River, and I spent the whole summer basically in waders and a tilly hat zapping fish out of those uh, Lake Erie tributaries. Um, so I've known Roger for quite some time now. Um, it's been a, uh, an excellent experience, and uh, definitely tap into him while you're here for the five weeks. He's one of those individuals, when I got the position, I knew it was going to be a fisheries position or a fish sampling position. We spent a lot of time looking for hellbenders and insects and learning about wetland plant species. So he's just, he's one of those true naturalist kind of individuals. So he knows a whole lot of information. So definitely sit down with him for a breakfast, lunch, or dinner and take his brain. So that's, that's great. While it's left. While there's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Roger actually uh, had his early part of his career was with the Ohio EPA, as, as I mentioned. Um, Resigned from that position in 04, is what yeah. we just talked about. And then from there you went to Ohio University and working for the Bonavich Center on some grants looking at basically Indiana crayfish. Yeah. And so there's some funny, yeah. funny from there. And then after his time left in eight, somewhere around there, About 2008. Eight, I retired. Eight, um, eight. eight, nine. And then he's been working for the Midwest Biodiversity Institute on, on grant money to continue studying, you know, an organism that he holds dear to his heart. If you ever uh, uh, have the opportunity to visit Roger's home in Westlake, his whole basement is filled with aquarium just jam-packed with crayfish. It's like a crayfish zoo. Somewhere in yeah, his basement. It's really sad. It's really sad. <laughs> <laughs> but he does have a great crayfish boil every once in a while, too. Yeah, so that's I good. had one this year. Yes. That's good. good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, again, I've already talked to Roger. He's going to kind of give an idea of what his trajectory was, and you'll see that it was, you know, different from what Chris Hennigut's trajectory was, and then, and then he'll start into his talk. So if we could welcome Roger Tillman. Okay, uh, before I... Before I go into how I got where I'm at, I'd just like to say that I'm a, I'm a very rich, wealthy man. Part of that, as evidence, is Dr. Winslow and Dr. Kane, who both had some association with me, and I consider them to be just wonderful people, and they make me feel good, just seeing them and talking to them. So, me more than Doug, though, right? Well, I'm not going to say. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. But uh, so, you know, Chris was talking about how some of us take a very circuitous route to our career, and that is not me. Uh, my, like most of you, my first experience with crayfish was when I was four years old. But the real significant experience for me was when I was in the sixth grade. My little league baseball coach bought a farm and built a pond and took a bunch of us little leaguers with him to hold the other end of the seine while we caught fish to put in his pond. And he noticed that I seemed to have a high level of enthusiasm for the catching of things. And we're standing in the middle. I said, I can remember as clear as a bell. I was standing in a stream next to him, and he turned to me, and he looked down, and he said, you know, Roger, they pay people to do this. And I was thunderstruck. I was like, oh, my God, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I just looked at him. He says, yeah, yeah, you go to, you go to ODNR, and they, they pay people to go out and catch fish like this. That was it, man. I was bit right there from the sixth grade on. I was going to be a fisheries biologist. This gave me a lot of trouble in junior. 
junior high school with girls and dating because they thought I was kind of weird, but, but I got through it, and here I am. So, and then the other major thing was I met a professor at Ohio State who was uh, Rachel Aranak. He's over here on the wall. He was a student here. He taught here, and when I was an undergraduate, he found out I was interested in fish, and he caught me in the hallway. I was going to Newark Branch campus, and he caught me in the hallway, and he was a hulking, big, you know, six foot five, six foot four guy, big beard. And he goes, Toma, what's this I hear? You're interested in fish. <coughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be a fisheries biologist, you know, and he said, be at my house Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. So I had to run around and figure out where he lived. He didn't help me. I had to go find that out, and I showed up at his house, and for the next four years, I was his volunteer assistant. I went everywhere I could with him whenever he was out collecting, and while my friends were going down to Florida on spring vacation, I was going to the Appalachian Mountains with Rachel Zarenak visiting the type localities of minnows, darters, and crayfish. And part of the reason was, back then, there weren't keys and there weren't guides to these things. You had to go figure it out yourself. You had to go visit the site, catch the critter that lived there, so that you could figure out what it was. So, it was a pretty straight route, but when it came to crayfish, when it came to the crayfish half of my career, it only took me 30 years to get competent enough to do it. So you're working away and you're 12, 15 years into your career, just remember, a little bit longer and you're going to have it all figured out and you're going to be able to at least publish a few papers. So don't give up the ship. So I'm going to talk about, I'll give you a little bit of a history of crayfish and, and uh, a little bit of their evolutionary history, which involves a lot of uh, geology, geological stuff. but. The, the gist of crayfish is that about 300 million years ago, they were, they were lobsters out in the marine environment. And they started moving into the fresh waters of Pangaea, which was this big, you know, supercontinent. And there's, there's, uh, there's several uh, uh, ev layers of evidence that, uh, for this. Uh, a, a guy named Crandall, who does genetics, did a genetic analysis that indicated that they were approximately 300 million years, you know, evolved 300 million years ago based on, you know, uh, changes in the in the biological clock and the mitochondria and stuff. And then a fellow named Hasiotis over in, uh, I think he's in Illinois these days or Indiana, uh, found has found fossils, fossil evidence of of crayfish that's about 300 million years old. And then a uh, Rode and Babcock did a morphometric study, which which was an analysis of the, you know, a crayfish is a segmented organism, but it's it's kind of all these segments have come together, and there's all this evidence of that, that the, all this the evidence of the evolution of how that those segments came together, and they estimated that it was 320 million years before present, and then. There's all, and then there's also the Creation Institute, which is uh, uh, 0 0.006 million years before present, which is, I, I believe, comes out to about 6,000 years. So. Uh, and that evidence is based mostly on what I consider wishful <coughs> thinking. So uh, I'm going with the 300 million year part. So, so here's the world. This is the 300 million year history of the world. Here's Pangaea. Right here, all the continents are kind of jammed together, and then in uh, in the Paleozoic, and then in the Mesozoic, things start to split apart, and the northern hemisphere continents are are called Laurasia, and the and the southern hemisphere continents are called Gondwana land, and then uh, getting into the Cenozoic, things start to really separate into what they look like today, and here here we are at the at the end of things, we've got North America, South America, Africa, Antarctica, Asia, uh, uh, this, uh, Australia, uh, 
uh, Greenland, stuff like that, okay? So here is a look at the world with the, with the uh, crayfish on it. There are what I consider there's technically in the literature there's three families, but I believe there's four. There's Astacidae over in Europe, and there's Camberoididae over in uh, Asia, over by uh, Japan and Korea. Then there's Camberidae, which is here in in North America, and then there's Parastacidae, which covers all of these southern continents. All right, and I have to I have to mention uh, since I put this talk together, and there's been a paper published in which a uh, professor at uh, Kent State I don't know if, if you know him. He does uh, fossils of decapod crustaceans. He says he has a fossil from the west coast of North America that is a member of the Parastacidae group. And so that is like, I'm trying to get my mind around that on how that works and I'm trying to figure out what's the scenario. And it, it, it may be that Parastacidae was much more widespread and then and then it's been uh, taken over and forced out by Camberidae and Astacidae. Uh, I'm, I'm still thinking on that one. But there's, there's, there's new stuff coming along all the time with crayfish. So here's, here's the free crayfish. I don't know if any, anybody here uh, ever goes see Spam a lot? You know, there's that he's, King Arthur is in the woods. And it's a, it's a dark, lonely, and very expensive place. Anyhow, that's the way, if you think about Spamalot, that's the way the world was before crayfish. Very <laughs> dark, lonely, not nothing good. And then, 237 million years ago or so, crayfish are here. And as Brennan Stimpy would say, oh, happy, happy, joy, joy. So, uh, and that's it, you know, we're in the Triassic now. And... Uh, and then about 195 million uh, years before present, uh, it appears that all of the all of the families of crayfish are in in place, and dinosaurs finally are getting their act together and showing up on the earth. But pretty soon, you know, they didn't last long. Dinosaurs did not last long, except for the birds. Now the birds, birds are a different story, but. So about 94, this is, now this is Roger's personal uh, opinion on this. I believe that the, the genera were mostly in place by 94 million years ago, but genetic evidence indicates that it was 30 million years ago. And, and the problem is we have little or no uh, fossil evidence in this period between 30 and 94 million years ago. So it's kind of, I'm kind of getting obsessed with finding fossils of crayfish. I found some out west uh, in an area. I found fossil crayfish burrows about 243 million years ago. I didn't find any body parts, but I'm going back and I'm, I'm going to try and excavate a whole fossil burrow. It's a, they're crayfish burrows and stuff. So anyhow, somewhere in here, all the genera have evolved. Okay, and then the dinosaurs are, are checking out pretty soon because they just can't handle it. And then, so, so here's a quick review of these families of crayfish, all right? So uh, the Astacidae are in the northern hemisphere. The Camberidae and the Camberoididae are in the northern hemisphere. The, the Camberoididae may actually, they're, they're more closely related to the Astacidae than they are to the Camberidae. But they, they have all these, there's a lot of differences. And then the Parastacidae is all in the southern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere crayfish have got gonopods, and the southern hemisphere crayfish do not have gonopods. These, that's a sperm transfer uh, organ on the male crayfish. And then there's differences in the females. Uh, Astacidae have no annual ventralis. Annual ventralis in, is is present in uh, only in the Camberidae, and it's like a small pocket on the female that opens up, and the, the, the male can deposit sperm in there, and then 
It can be closed up and the female can carry this sperm around with her for extended periods. The other groups with no annulus ventralis, they, the male deposits a sperm packet on the sternum of the female. So it's not quite as efficient as what the Camberidae do. And then the Peristacidae, no annulus ventralis and no gonopod. So that's kind of the basic difference between the two. Now here's the distribution of these things in a in a modern setting, this is the Camberidae. This is the group that I am pretty much all the time thinking about. This is the uh, this is the Astacidae, and and it's a very interesting distribution because you've got them over here in Europe, over to the like the Ural Mountains, and then you've got some over here on the Pacific Coast. And when you look at the genetics of those two groups, Astacidae. This is, this is all Asticus, and this is all uh, Pacifasticus. Uh, they're, you know, they're right together. They're obviously, you know, derived from each other. And then there's this Camberoididae, which they, people have thrown in with the Camberidae because they have a gonopod that has a, it has a hardened, uh, uh, sclerotized <coughs> tip to it. So these two have this hardened gonopod tip, whereas the Asticus and Pacifasticus don't. So they were like, oh, well, they must be closely related. But it turns out, genetically, these guys are more closely related to Asticus than they are to, to Camberidae. And here's this weir really weird southern hemisphere distribution of the Peristacidae. You got them over here in, like, Paraguay. And then you've got them over here in Argentina and Chile on the Pacific coast. Then there's a small group that lives right here in Madagascar. And they're in dire straits because there's so many people in Madagascar and they need things to eat. And these guys get pretty big and they eat them. And then Australia and New Zealand and up here into the... Uh, Area and Jaya, you know, kind of the kind of the Philippines area, and then and there's Tasmania. The greatest number of species is here in the Camberidae, up here in North America, 300 and some species of crayfish. The next greatest diversity is Australia. Right now, they're almost up to 200. I suspect when we get done, there'll be over 400 different species of Camberidae. And there'll probably be over 300 species in Australia. Right now, here in uh, Irian Jaya, it's a very mountainous island. It's got this ridge of mountains that run right down the center of it. And it's got all these little riblets that run off of those mountains. Every riblet's got its own species in it. They're describing species from their left and right. Uh, several species were just described this year. And everywhere you go, uh, you get a new species. The hard part about this is it's so remote that the natives tend to come out and shoot at you with bows and arrows if you're running around. So what they, one of the ways they're getting material from that area to look at and study is they're getting it through the pet trade. So there's people over there that can go around and collect these crayfish, and they sell them into the European pet trade. And these guys over in Europe are describing all these new species from over here uh, in, uh, in Irian Jaya and stuff. It's just too damn dangerous to go over there and collect on your own. It's very dangerous. So anyhow, so here's a, a quick overview of the Camberidae, which is our, the principal North American uh, group. The, the Pacifasticus has got about nine or so species. In it. There's been some recent genetic work that indicates that uh, there's more diversity there than is presently recognized, and there's several things that may have to be described. So there's 11 genera in the Camberidae. There's over 363 species. Approximately 50% of the crayfish in this family are either vulnerable uh, are either uh, like the vulnerable, threatened, or endangered, all right? And there's a lot of endangered stuff in there. The distribution, as you saw, was, you know, Mexico, Canada, Eastern United States. 
Two species may be extinct. One we're fairly certain, uh, and the other one we're not quite sure yet. There's one that had the misfortune of living in the Los Angeles area, which is not a good place to live if you're an aquatic organism, because every stream in that area is lined with cement. Every stream in, in Los Angeles is a pretty effective death trap for humans if they get in there when the water's flowing, but there's, there's no bottom, there's no sides, there's no nothing. So that species is probably extinct. We have, we have the smallest species in the world, which are these little things called Camborellus that live down in the Mississippi embayment area, and they live in vegetation, and they, they live about one year. They hatch, they make it to the next year, they lay eggs, and they, they die. They, sometimes they lay eggs in their first summer. They grow so fast. And then the, the habitats that uh, North American crayfish live in are streams, rivers, lakes, wetlands, burrows. This is my, this is what I love more than anything, burrowing crayfish, and in caves. So the threats, the conservation threats to our North American crayfish species primarily come from mining. I'm sure everyone here has heard of mountaintop removal mining. Very, very bad. For crayfish. The other one, a big problem, is the introduction of exotic species. So people get crayfish to go fishing with, and when they're done, they have a bucket of crayfish that they haven't used, and they put them in the water. Those crayfish have been shipped from Minnesota or somewhere, and they're not native to that water. You dump your bait bucket out, and the next thing you know, you have an exotic population of crayfish established, and that population frequently outcompetes the native crayfish because when you're when you're farming things, you want to farm only the toughest things that you can find. You don't want to farm sensitive stuff because you're going to waste a lot of money. They don't live well. They don't do well. They don't reproduce. They don't grow. So you get these things that are really tough, that grow fast, that are very aggressive, and they survive well in a in a tank or a pond or whatever you put them in and then you send, ship them out for people to fish with, and then they dump them in the rivers, and they just take over the rivers. We, we have the rusty crayfish here. That's been introduced all over the place. I now understand it is in South Africa. That's a wonderful thing. There are no crayfish species native to Africa. Someone has managed to get red swamp crawfish and rusty crayfish introduced into, into South Africa. They're showing up all over the place. It's, it's a... It's, it's a bad situation. When you get crayfish in an area where there weren't crayfish before, they completely change ecosystems. So they're like, a, they're like a keystone species. You know, you put them in and everything changes and adapts to, to their presence, and, and that's happening everywhere. The other thing that's, that's uh, a big factor in North America, whoops, in North America, am I going backwards? Yes, it is. Uh, narrow distributions. There are, uh, I just described, uh, I just got a published a species description this spring uh, of a crayfish that basically lives in one place. There's this little tiny section of the Powell River in Virginia that uh, it's called the South Fork of the Powell River. It flows off of a mountain and then goes down into a, what a Ridge and Valley area. If you know, if you know the Ridge and Valley province, it's, it's the Ridge and Valley has very wide valleys of of limestone, and the streams in those areas are warm water. And then up on the ridges, you have your typical mountain stream that's very cold. So this little thing lives in this little tiny stream, and it's isolated by the fact that the stream flows down into this valley, and then the habitat is not suitable. And so I, it, it's, uh, it's about, I believe the stream's about, the section that's occupied is about four kilometers, but basically it's one population. You know, it's just from the, from the top to the bottom, four kilometers, and uh, it's probably one of the more restricted, distributionally restricted crayfish in, in North America. And I am uh, working with a group to get it petitioned for uh, endangered species classification. 
eradication by fish and wildlife. And then the other thing that hurts crayfish a lot is deforestation, especially in the Appalachian Mountains where <coughs> the hillsides and the mountainsides are very steep. Lots of sediment runs off, just completely chokes streams and wipes out crayfish populations. Really reduces their abundance. So here's a big picture view of, of the United States. All of these states, have 11 or fewer crayfish species in them. Now, you know, we're not done describing everything, so some of this is going to change, but this gives you an idea of where the diversity is. So, up in here, Ohio, Illinois, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Virginia. Virginia is going to change a lot soon because I've got some stuff there to describe. West Virginia, those are uh, 11 to 30 species in those states known. And then as soon as you get out of uh, this, these areas, these northern areas where there's been a lot of glaciation, and you get on the other south of the Ohio River, you jump up to 50 species in Kentucky. There's, there's more than that in there. But the big ones are Tennessee and Alabama. And this is basically due to the fact that the old ancient Tennessee River flows comes down through here, out of Tennessee, skirts along the edge of Georgia, and then goes into Tennessee or Alabama and comes back out and enters the Ohio River here. And the old Tennessee River Basin is just loaded with stuff, all kinds of things in there. A lot of things yet to be described. Probably Alabama and Tennessee will have over 100 species in them by the time all the descriptions are done. And then you got you got you got this heavy concentration of species diversity down here in the, in the southern Appalachian Mountains, which is uh, which was hypothesized by a fellow named Horton Hobbs at the Smithsonian as the point of origin for that particular for the genus Tamparis. And then another point another point of origin is over here in Missouri and Arkansas and stuff, and that's Orconectes. And then down in here on the coastlines, you have a, a genus called Procambrus. Okay, but uh, the big diversity is down here associated with the Appalachian Mountains, and it's a, it's a fun place to collect if you like. If you like going collecting, it's a great place to go. So a few years ago, in uh, 2007, a group of us got together under the auspices of a guy named Chris Taylor. And he asked us to all get together and, and do an assessment of the conservation status of North America's crayfish. So, and it was published in Fisheries. You can download a PDF of it at my, at my site. You'll have to go to crayfishstudies.com, and then you go to the, there's a little publication. There's a banner up above. Click on Publications, and it'll take you to a spot where you can download this, this article, and it has what at the time, all the species that were known and, and an assessment of their conservation status. So, so that was in 2007. And uh, after we did this, we got, a, we got a call from the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Are you fam familiar with IUCN? It's an it's a international group that's trying to classify the conservation status of every species out there, okay? And they called us together, and a bunch of us met up in Chicago and spent a week locked up in a room about half this size talking every species of crayfish in North America about, you know, what was its status, how, what was its distribution, what was it threatened by, and all this stuff. And we came up with a, with a, uh, a big list of things or the IUCN, and they took that, and recently they, they, they posted it on their, on their website. But in the interim, there was a, a, there's a group out in Arizona called the Center for, uh, Center for Biological Diversity. And they got together with a, uh, with a group of other conservation organizations, and they filed a petition with Fish and Wildlife to list 404 aquatic species from the southeastern United States as endangered, all right? Uh, 
uh, and this is kind of interesting. There's a little tale that goes on here. Uh, there used to be 20-some crayfish on the uh, list of potential species for endangered species status. All right? And sometime in the middle of the George W. Bush administration, they disappeared from the list which was basically a violation of the law. The law says you have to consider and you have to review their status before you can either move them onto the list or, or move them off of the candidate list. So somewhere in the Bush administration, somebody just took a big old pencil and scratched them all out, and they disappeared off the list. So they're back. They've been petitioned, those plus, plus more. This, uh, this petition had uh, 81 of the species that were petitioned were crayfish. And there is a lot of work going on right now to see if those 81 species are uh, good, worthy of being considered endangered or not. Whether they should be taken off the list. I currently have a, a grant with the state of Tennessee to look at seven of the species that live in their state. So I've got a three-year project in Tennessee. I'm looking at these seven species. Uh, most of them definitely need some sort of conservation status. One of them is just, it's all the way from Alabama to, to Kentucky on that on an upper on an upland area between the Tennessee River and the Mississippi. It's not going to be anything. It's going to be common by the time I, I get done with it, but it's a burrower. And people don't go around looking for burrowers. They're too hard to collect. Well, that one's all over the place. So anyhow, I've got a project looking looking at seven of Tennessee's things and a lot of these things are being looked at to see if they warrant uh, conservation status and danger species status or not, and uh, so I'd like to, just uh, some of the more interesting ones, I'd like to run through some crayfish uh, in North America to give you a, a little flavor and then a, a few stories about these things uh, that I've run into. I'm going to first show you some of the crayfish that are fairly common, fairly stable, at large distributions and large populations. This is a, a little thing called Camberus gentrii that lives in along the Highland Rim. I don't know if you know, I've been beating my students to death with discussing the Cincinnati Arch or Arc, all right, which is a big limestone formation that comes down out of Canada and goes all the way down into Alabama. And it's a, it's a geologic fe geological feature that has a big influence on zoogeography. And this little thing, which is really cool, I just love the color of it, it's like gold and, and blue, uh, lives along the edges of the, of the Cincinnati Arc where you, you, it, it forms a basin down in Tennessee. Uh, and this thing lives up on the hillsides where the streams drain into that, into that basin area. And it's, it's fairly common. It, it's, uh, it doesn't have a giant distribution, but it's, there's a lot of individual populations of this little thing. Then this is the, uh, this is Canberra's acanthera, the uh, spiny tail crayfish. Is that what it is? The spiny right? Something. Yeah. And uh, this thing is pretty stable also. It's pretty widespread in Georgia, northern Georgia, and and southern Tennessee, I found a few populations that came almost all the way up to Kentucky, so it's a little bit wider spread than we had initially thought. And uh, it's a burrower, again. And this is uh, Orchonectes placidus, which is very widespread in uh, parts of the Tennessee and Cumberland Basin, and it's one of those species that's getting moved around by the fishing industry, f fishermen, and it's invading other systems, and it's causing uh, some conservation issues for n the native crayfishes in the, in the streams where it's been getting introduced to. It's one of those things that you can 
put in a paint bucket and carry around all day, and it's pretty damn tough. And and by the end of the day, it'll still be alive. Then uh, this is a uh, Canberra's angularis, which is confined to the the Powell River and the Clinch River over in Virginia, where they flow south and then enter into Tennessee, and then you get down into Tennessee, and everything's been dammed up and turned into a lake, and that's where it ends. And uh, it's uh, that's part of the Upper Tennessee River Basin. And there's a population over in the Holston River, which is to the east of the, you got the Powell, you got the Clinch, and then you got the Holston. There's a population over in the Holston River that may actually be something different. It's very similar, but it, it shows some genetic differences and it shows some morphological differences. And, and uh, it's going to have to be worked up to see exactly what it is. But it's, you know, there's lots of work out there if you want to fiddle around with crayfish. There's plenty to do. Right, Tom? I agree. <laughs> there's, a, there's a ton of stuff. Here's a, here's a beautiful thing. This was the first undescribed species I ever collected. I was out with Rachel Zarenak. We were down in Kentucky. We were up in this little tiny tributary of the Cumberland River, and there was a rock. Well, I guess it was about that big. Big rock. Took Ray, both Ray and I, to get this rock tipped up off of the sediment. And Ray was straining to hold the rock up, and I peeked under, and there was this giant crayfish under the rock, right under the center of the rock. And Ray goes, "I'll hold the rock, and you get, <laughs> you go under there and get it, Raj." <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay, Ray, if my legs are sticking out by the end, and there's nothing else for me to see." So I crawled under there and I got, I grabbed this thing and I pulled it out. And, and Ray and I, it was like, it was like serendipity on the spot. We looked at it and we were like, holy smokes, this is something new. This is, this is not, this does not have a name. We just looked at it and it was like, whoa, we know this is. So we run back to Ohio, back to Ohio State University, and we, we got the specimens and we're looking at them. We're getting ready. We're thinking, okay, we're going to return. We've got to get more specimens. We've got to get enough to, for a type series. And we're going to describe this thing. And two months later, a paper comes out from Horton Hobbs at the Smithsonian <laughs> describing Canberra's Cumberlandensis. So we got, we got scooped right there, <laughs> right out from under us, you know. So, but. It's a beautiful species, a really, really cool critter. Big, giant thing, you know, really gets large. Uh, this little thing, can you see him in there? Down here all tucked in? This, this is a, 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 a little thing, and, and there's three species in this subgenus, uh, and they all kind of do the same thing. I'm publishing, I got, a, I got a manuscript in uh, where I'm talking about another species, a species I named after Ray, called Canberra's Gisernaki. And it, they have a very unusual lifestyle. And what they do, especially these little guys, as soon as I threw him in this thing with a bunch of little rocks, he just got into the rocks and started moving around like a little bulldozer and pushing, un and pushing under the rocks. It wasn't long. I got this picture, but it wasn't long that he had himself completely down in the rocks. And what they do is they don't really dig so much as they just kind of push their way through the interstitial openings between the substrate in streams. And uh, so you can imagine they're very sensitive to silt. You get any silt or sand in the stream, and you fill up those interstices with, with sediment, they're dead. They're done. They can't, they, they can't live. And the same goes for Gisernak guy. It, it, it's on the side of the stream, and it kind of pushes the rocks away and kind of skitters down into the rocks, and they don't really burrow. And so with, with crayfish, there's three general classifications for crayfish. There's primary, secondary, and tertiary burrowers. So the lifestyles are broke up into these three things depending on how much they burrow. Well, these guys, these guys don't fit any of those. So in my paper, I'm proposing a new lifestyle, and I'm calling it an interstitial lithophile. 
saying, they live in the interstices between rocks. They like to live in the rocks, and that's how they make their living. If you want to collect these little guys, you go to a riffle, and you, you just start pulling the rocks out of the riffle like this. Like you just move up through the riffle like that. And as you move up, they just come tumbling out of the gravel in there. They're just, they're just in there like another rock or something. They're really, they're really cool. And they're all really, these guys are really small. Jezer and that guy is small, but these guys are these guys are just little things like this in there. They have all these little hairs on their keely and stuff. You can't see it from here, but they have a bunch of little hairs on their keely. And this is the, this is a uh, a relative of that uh, brachydactylus, which means hairy keely. And uh, you can't really see it here, but and he's I've got him in a in a container where he couldn't go into the rocks and stuff so that, so that I could get a picture of him before he disappeared. He was a tough one to get to behave. It took me a while. And uh, these guys are fairly stable. They're not very widespread, but they're fairly stable where they're at. Here's a thing that lives in Ohio, Kentucky, and Indiana. It's a burrower, Canberra's Ortmanai, named after Arnold E. Ortman from the Carnegie Museum, who did crayfish back in the 30s, did a lot of really important work with crayfish, was named by one of his students, and uh, they're kind of fun to collect. Tom and I found these things much more widespread in Indiana than we had ever suspected. They, they, make it, they made it almost all the way up to uh, Gary, Indiana, just like to the outskirts. We, we got some over in that area. So this thing is much more widespread than previously thought. And then this is a thing called Canberra's Carinorostris, which is uh, – I was lecturing my students the other day on the preglacial Tays River and the preglacial Allegheny River and the preglacial Ohio River. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you better get yourself a book and find out. Because if you're going to be a biologist around here, you damn well better know it because it's a very important factor in aquatic organisms around here. And you better brush up on glaciation and learn a bunch of geology because if you don't, you're going to be stupid and you're not going to know what you're doing. <laughs> so I just say go ahead and do it and get it over with and learn it. So this guy is, this guy is from the preglacial Allegheny River, which is a river that used to flow north and east out of Ohio and into what's Pennsylvania and possibly into the, the uh, Laurentian River Basin. And uh, when the glaciers came down, they reversed the flow of the Allegheny River and it joined up with the Hayes River, which used to flow, which is, if you, if you know where the new river starts, in North Carolina, which flowed out of North Carolina and up into Virginia and then turned and went into West Virginia and came down through West Virginia and went and then entered Ohio and went somewhere off to the northwest in Ohio. It's possibly the oldest permanently flowing river on the earth. The new river, which is, which is the, uh, ironically, is the oldest river, <laughs> uh, which was historically called the Taze River, uh, has been around and flowing ever since the Appalachian Mountains started to rise up out of the ocean when, when the African plate and the European plate collided with the North American plate and started crunching things up. And this river was pushed up, and it's been flowing for over 350 million years. It's full of diversity that reflects that 350 million year history. And this is, this is something that was, that was not in the Taze River, but in, the, in another river system that flowed north. And if you go to what used to be the Taze River, there's another species very closely related to this that, that is found in there. And these things have, are, are there because of geology, because of the history of the Earth. And that's, that's important stuff to know. So, and then this is Pastopasticus lenulisculus, which is currently stable on the West Coast. Um, this one was just recently studied. This may actually be four different genetic populations. 
that may warrant species recognition. They're being worked on to see if they can figure out how to tell them apart. Here's the, here's the bad news about this crayfish. In North America, crayfish carry a thing called crayfish fungus. It's an actual fungus that lives on crayfish. If you take a North American crayfish to any other part of the world, those crayfish do not have crayfish fungus on them. And you put these crayfish in the water, and pretty soon all the native crayfish are dead because they all got crayfish fungus and it killed them. Well, Europe, they love their crayfish in Europe, and they had a hell of a crayfish fishery over there. And they were catching crayfish in their rivers. And if you think North America got a bad deal with introductions of exotics, you need to go over to Europe. They, they got the hell beat out of them with exotics. And they got these crayfish over there, and they got introduced. There's, there's like five different North American crayfish species in Europe right now. And their crayfish populations have just been decimated. It, and some of them are on the verge of extinction. And they're very difficult to keep alive. Because you can't get rid of these things once they're, once they're in, they're in. You're not getting rid of them. They're ensconced, they're in the ecosystem, and they carry their little fungus with them. And when the European species start to recover and get enough individuals, the fungus flares up, and in, in two weeks you'll have thousands and thousands of dead crayfish laying around from crayfish fungus. It's really bad, really a mess. So this thing was taken over to Europe and has made a lot of trouble, but on the west coast, it's doing pretty good. You can go out there and catch these babies. They're nice and big, and they're they're tasty, and uh, and so on. So here's some here. Now I want to get into some of the rare and endangered stuff. Good God, it's almost ten o'clock. All right. <laughs> so here's a here's this little here's a little crayfish called Camberus obeyensis. It lives in it actually lives in Hurricane Creek, and I don't know if you know what a, a sump is. Down south, you have streams that flow along, and they hit a limestone area, and they disappear into the limestone. And, they, and down, down the south, they call it a sump. I don't know. I have a sump pump in my basement. It's not the same thing, but anyhow. So this crayfish lives in a little tiny stream called Hurricane Creek that flows down. It's, in the, it's on the uh, Cumberland Plateau. It flows down this sandstone area and all of a sudden it hits a layer of limestone and disappears and there's no streams anywhere around, nowhere. And so it's isolated up in this little stream and it seems to have evolved into its own little species. And uh, recently I was called down to Tennessee because some guy bought a piece of property, the sandstone, and he wanted to mine the sandstone and sell it for I don't know exactly what, but it was high quality sandstone. Uh, fortunately for Obeyensis, the guy went bankrupt. Okay, so he didn't he didn't mine the area, and, and it looks like this little guy is, is got a reprieve. This I just described this one. I was telling my students about it. Camberus calayanus. Uh, we did a, a emergency uh, petition on this species to get. When it was petitioned, we did an emergency petition to try and get them to make a decision in one year. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service just came out uh, last month and has proposed this as an endangered species. Actually, when we started this, we thought we were dealing with a thing called Camberus veteranus, but it turns out that there were two populations very similar and, and they were different species, and this one did not have a name, so we had to describe it so that the fish and wildlife could recognize that it was a, a crayfish, apparently. And, uh, and so now the fish and wildlife has proposed listing two things as endangered, Camberus veteranus, which lives in the Guyandop River over in West Virginia, and Camberus calayanus, which lives in the Big Sandy River on the border of West Virginia, Kentucky, and, and Virginia. And so, uh, apparently, 
there's a good chance that we're going to end up in court because this species is, it turns, somebody, somebody wrote that this is the first species ever to be declared in danger because of mountaintop removal mining, which I find kind of staggering because mountaintop removal mining is a, just an unbelievably destructive, environmentally destructive activity. And I can't believe there haven't been other species that have been listed as endangered. But this, they, they were saying, this is the first one that's ever, that's ever been listed and part of the cause was mountaintop mining, uh, mountaintop removal mining. So apparently, the fish and wildlife people say, we're probably gonna end up in court and we're gonna be attacked by you know, lawyers from basically the coal industry and we're gonna, we're gonna find out how it works. Should be fun. I had the I had the honor of being the uh, plaintiff in that in that lawsuit to get this emergency listing. So uh, I'm I'm persona non grata down in West Virginia. <laughs> I'm sure that if there if there are people down there who knew what I was doing when I was down there staying in their hotels, I might not have made it out alive. <laughs> I, I don't know, but. That's been a pretty fun thing to do. Uh, here's a, a species I described from down in North Carolina. I've got a manuscript that uh, I'm having an argument with my co-authors on. A, a, a fellow from the North Carolina Department of Natural Resources wants to say it's stable, and I believe it should be listed as threatened. It's not endangered, but it is, it's in a fairly precarious position. So it's got a very small distribution. It's only found in the, basically in the Linville River, and there's a couple populations that have gotten established, one in the Watauga and one over in the Tow River, which are like, you know, tributaries that butt up against it. So it's gotten out of the Linville and it's gotten into these other streams, but it's not very widespread at all. And I think threatened is the, so I, my last communication with my co-author was, well, if you're going to say it's not threatened, I'm going to take my name off the paper. You'll have to publish it by yourself. I don't, you know, I don't want to be on there. We'll see. Here's a, a, a species I described from down. It, it lives in two counties, one county of Tennessee and one county in Georgia, and that's it. And it's, it's a bizarre place down there because there's another, this is a burrower, and there's another burrower down there that lives only in those two counties. I don't know what's going on geologically down there, but there's something about this little place that there's all these endemic burrowing crayfish in. I don't know. I don't know how it works, but uh, that was the that was the first one I ever collected, and that was another one of those serendipity moments where I pulled this thing out of a burrow and I took one look at it and I was like, oh my god, that is described species. i would never seen anything like that. Now, it only took me 30 years to figure that out, though. You know, I didn't just pull up a crayfish one day and go, oh, that's an undescribed species, you know. Uh, first, I had to know every other crayfish around that, that lived there, and I had to know what they looked like, because if I didn't, I wouldn't know what I was holding, so I had to know what it wasn't. And, and there's a lot of things in Tennessee to know, and it takes a long time to know that. But when you get into it as far long and as deep as I am, you do this kind of stuff where you go out and you collect something and you go, well, that is totally new. Never seen one of those before. And then you spend a few weeks looking at it and you figure out, okay, it looks like it's something different. And then it only takes you seven years to get it done. It only takes you seven years to go out and collect it and find out where it lives and what its range is and get enough material together and then write the paper and get it published. Just like that. It's a piece of cake. <laughs> this stuff is just, you know, you just go out and pick them off trees. Anyhow, <laughs> here's, here's something that was described by Chris Taylor. It lives in this little area of Tennessee where there are these small hills with little spring-fed streams that have high chert content. That's it. As soon as you get out of, out of the springs, out of the chert, 
away from the limestone, it, it's gone. So it lives, it lives in basically, it lives in several counties, but it's basically its district range is really like about the size of a county. And it's just, there's this unusual geological formation there, and there's this unusual crayfish in there. And it's a pretty cool little critter. Uh, one of my favorites. Oh God, this thing is, this thing is unbelievable. Troglocambarus McLeani. As you can see, it's a cave species, right? Everybody recognizes something like that as a cave species. This species lives down in Florida, and the type of locality is a place called Squirrel Chimney Cave, right? <laughs> now, they found it in a few other caves in this county, but not many. This, the, uh, they, they never, they, they, they knew there were crayfish in this cave. There's, there's another species of crayfish that lives with it. But they never knew that this one was in there also. And the reason they didn't know it is that it's a, it's a, it's a flooded cave, okay? So the only way to explore the cave is to get on your scuba gear and go swimming down into the cave, which is about one of the most dangerous things you can do in this world. Uh, and some guys were in the cave doing some work, and they were swimming along, and all of a sudden this crayfish came floating down through the water column. And they were like, what the, what's this? You know, and they took it, and they, they brought it back. And they, they got it to Dr. Hobbs at the Smithsonian, and Dr. Hobbs was like, well, this is a whole new genus. This is just, isn't just a species. It's a whole new genus that, that you've got. And so they went back to look for more. And in their, in their endeavors to find more of these things, what they found out was that the cave had two crayfish in it. On the bottom of the cave were these big, husky, large, pinchered crayfish. And all these little delicate troglo canvas neplani, which use these little mouth parts out here to filter feed, were hanging from the surface of the ceiling of the cave, hanging from the ceiling. Of the, of the cave, and if they got knocked off and floated down to the bottoms, the ones that lived on the bottom would run over and grab them and eat them. So this thing spends its whole life in these caves, hanging from the ceiling, because if it doesn't, it's pretty much doomed, you know? It's a very delicate, you know, little thing, and uh, really an interesting species. And, and the fact that it's a filter feeder, you know, it's in the cave, and it's like, it's like grooming its antennae and its body and, and getting little particulate matter that, that settles off of its body, and that's what it's eating. And, oh, and as you might guess, most of these cave crayfish live a pretty long time. Uh, and the best estimate right now is that they live at least 25 years. So... Uh, crayfish live a lot longer than we have than, than we have thought. And uh, down in my crayfish gulag, I have a few crayfish that have been there. I have one that's like 13 or 14 years old. Wow! I brought it back from Indiana when I was working with Tom. Brought back a female that had eggs. Some of the eggs hatched. I kept some of them alive. That was like 13 or 14 years ago, and it's still. You know, we were working on the Potoka River. Tom and I did a project on the Potoka River where there's a crayfish or connectis indianensis. Pretty rare. I don't know if it would make it as a federally endangered species, but it's certainly threatened. All the, there's, there's a, a little mining, there's a lot of oil and gas exploration over there, and, and uh, Tom did a, a study on the chemistry of the rivers, and a lot of them are, have very high salt content and stuff. And, and it's impacting uh, Orconectes indianensis, and you know, there's a lot going on out there. There's a lot of endangered crawdads out there. This one, this is great. I just described this species this spring, and I named it after my, my mom. Because my mom pretty much got me through college by paying tuition for me, okay? If not, I'd have been over in Vietnam, and I'd probably be dead, like a lot of my friends are. And uh, I named that after my mom, but what's really cool is 
the paper was published two weeks before Mother's Day. So when I when I went down to see my mom on Mother's Day this year, I was like, Hey mom, there's a crayfish named after you. <laughs> what the <laughs> What are you talking about? No. No, she thought it was pretty cool. My mom has always known that I'm weird. When I was a little kid, when I was a little kid in Florida where I was born, I used to sit out on the car patio and I used to watch the the uh, the wasp, the, the parasitic wasps, bring caterpillars in and bury them in the you know they dig holes in the garden and bury them. And I, I can remember sitting out there for hours just watching, you know, a wasp stick like four or five caterpillars in a hole and then, and then cover it up and it was just like, wow, this is really cool. I like this, you know. Oh, I have to tell you a little sidebar. I got in trouble with my dad one day. My brothers and my friends went out. And we're all like grade school guys, right? We decided, we heard about king snakes and that king snakes could kill poisonous snakes. So we got all our buddies, all, all of our six seven-year-old buddies together, and we went on a snake roundup out behind the, out in the Palm Meadows behind our house. And when my dad came home from work, we had the screened-in porch full of snakes. I think we, had like, we had like 30 snakes in there. We didn't find any king snakes, and we didn't get any poisonous snakes, but by God, we vacuumed up every snake out in the woods behind our house and had them in our patio, and my old man walked in and saw the patio full of snakes, and he, he just... He totally freaked out. It's, <laughs> that's the best I can say. It's, that's, that's a polite way to say it. But, you know, I've always been out catching stuff. It's just, just what I do, I guess. And then, here's... Uh, oh, God. Yeah, we should... 914, you want, you want to quit? Because <laughs> I know we had two exams that kids were studying before. So yeah. A little bit. I think we should... You think you can? I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> I'll try and get through this. All right, I'm just going to get the briefest of overview here. First, I'm going to start with a, with a, a, a species complex of undescribed crayfish. All right? There's a crayfish out there called Canberra's dubious, and it's, it's thought to live from somewhere up in southern Pennsylvania all the way down into the middle part of Tennessee and North Carolina and over in Kentucky, and it, it follows the strike of the Appalachian Mountains. The problem is when you start looking at this thing that everybody put put into this under this one name, it's obviously not the same thing. This is a form that's associated with the Cumberland Plateau. This is a form that's associated with the Appalachian foothills. You might notice they look a little different. This one is uh, up in the Rigid Valley area of Tennessee and Virginia. This one is up in the mountain area of, uh, of southern Virginia. It's in a very small area around Powell Mountain, and, uh, and, and that's about it on Powell Mountain. Uh, this one is confined to the Blue Ridge province. You know, the, if you know your provinces of the Appalachian Mountains, there's this one long stretch that goes north and south, and this thing occupies from uh, Virginia, southern Virginia, all the way down into, uh, into North Carolina, and it's confined to that geographic area. And, and then here's a little thing that lives up in the New River. That's, it's actually a species complex. If you go down into North Carolina and you look at some of the Atlantic drainages, there's three different forms down there, and they have all these morphological differences. Uh, and so this one's from the New River, the South Fork of the New River. And then, oh, this is, I love this one. This one lives in Lewis County, Kentucky. And that's it. And it lives in two little streams that flow into the Ohio River that used to be parts of the preglacial Portsmouth River that flowed northeast out of Kentucky and went up into Ohio and joined the Taze River. This thing, Physically, everything on this critter's body looks like Canberra's dubious, except for the coloration. And we ran a genetic analysis on it, and it's actually an example of convergent evolution, where this thing burrows like a dubious in the kind of habitats dubious lives in, 
And so it's taken on the body form of a dubious, but genetically it's related to something that lives down in southern Kentucky in a river, Canberra's distance, which doesn't, which hardly burrows at all. But here's the good part about this. I'm out there looking for a, a good population to get type specimens from, and there's not a lot of places to collect this. But I find this guy that's got a yard that's just covered with these things. Okay? So I'm telling him, you have a rare crayfish in your yard. It's, you know, lives nowhere else. And I'm here, I'm trying to get enough material to describe it and stuff. And he goes, how do you kill these things? <laughs> what you, what you, you know, I haven't even got it described yet. Give me a couple of years, you know, you get this done before you go poison every damn crayfish out here and, and, and extirpate the species from the earth. You know, all, he's, all he wants to do is get out there and spray the holes and, and kill all the, the crayfish that are making little mud piles in his yard because, you know, mowing, the mowing of grass is one of the most important things a human being can do. Just remember that. When you grow up and you get your own place, mowing grass is so, so very important. <laughs> and then I think this is the last one. This one I thought was another species. I thought it was something else, and then we did a genetic analysis on this thing, and all of a sudden this little population plopped out. I was like, well, you, you know, you got to be kidding me. I wasn't even looking for something. And boom, there it was. And it lives, it lives between Cumberland Mountain and Pine Mountain. And uh, I think I'm, I, I'm thinking about calling it Intermontanus, because there used to be a crayfish called Canberras Montanus, and the type specimen was housed at the Chicago, housed in Chicago, and the type specimen was destroyed in the Chicago fire, and we couldn't figure, nobody's been able to figure out what it was, so the name had to be, had to be you know, suppressed, and so I'm thinking, wouldn't that be cool to get Montanus back? And we'll just call it Intermontanus because it lives between these mountains. And uh, at first, I was going to call it. I, it, it, it. At first, I had a different idea because it was found in a. There's, it's heavy coal mining in this area, and in a lot of coal mining areas, you'll you'll find streams called Stinking Creek. And the reason they're called Stinking Creek is because the sulfur from the coal is getting into the stream and it smells like rotten eggs. And uh, I thought at first it was confined to Stinking Creek, so I was going to name it Canberras Stinking Ensis, the Stinking Crayfish. <laughs> I was going to, you know, it's a common name, but it turns out it's actually much more widespread, so I had to give that one up. But I like Inner Montana, so I think that's it, yeah. Okay, sorry. So I am going to casually walk towards my bag over here because I've got a 9.30 ferry to catch. But I definitely want questions. Yeah, you better get moved. <laughs> so but please, uh, I'll leave it open for questions for Roger. And again, thank you guys all for your attendance here. And I will see you um, in a week. From now, so good luck with your projects, good luck with your courses. Roger, please take any questions. Yeah. Thank you. See you, Chris. Absolutely. Say hi. Absolutely. Anybody got a question? The last point I want to make here is that there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot to do in the field of conservation. So, you guys, it's not going to be easy. You're not going to make a lot of money, but there's going to be jobs out there. And there's going to be jobs working with bivalves, and there's going to be jobs working with fish, and there's going to be jobs working with crayfish, and there's going to be jobs working with snails, because there's a ton of endangered stuff out there that needs to be studied and needs to be conserved. And that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. I'm just writing little grant proposals to state. I'm retired. I have a retirement income. I just do this stuff on the side. And I, there's not a year goes by that I'm not out that I don't find something new and I don't 
find something that's rare and endangered. And, and uh, it's an uphill battle. For example, in Kentucky, Kentucky does not fund crayfish studies. That's it. They don't. They've got a ton of endangered stuff in their state, and they, they have absolutely no funding that they give out for the studying of crayfish. They also have, a, uh, the person I worked with in Kentucky that, uh, that I did a small project with informed me that the government, the governor, does not want them to discuss global warming in any of their reports. So you've heard about Florida, you know. They, they have an edict down in Florida, you're not allowed to discuss global warming, which is pretty ironic because they're the ones that are going first. <laughs> <laughs> they're, going, they're going soon, you know. And then, like, you get up to Kentucky, they're, they're wed to the coal industry, and they're carrying water for the coal industry, and it's an uphill slug in that state. They're going to be really pissed off when they realize that I use that money to describe Canberra's Calais in this and they're going to have to change their ways over in the big sandy river basin. But too late. I live in Ohio. <laughs> Tough luck, you know. So anyhow, it's a good field to be in. You won't get rich, but you'll be you'll be employed because we're not running out of endangered.